Today we're going to be learning Yevama Daf Kuf Yud Zayin. It's the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start at the bottom of Kuf Tet Zayin Amubet at the Mishnah. Beit Shammai Omrim, Tinasei V'titok Tubata. If you have a woman who can test, who testifies that her husband died, we believe her testimony about herself to allow her what? To get married. And not only to get married, according to Beit Shammai, but also to get her Ketubah money. Beit Hillel Omrim, Tinasei V'lo Titok Tubata. Beit Hillel says no. She can get married, but she can't get her Ketubah money. Why? So we're going to see. Amrula and Beit Shammai, in other words, what Beit Hillel are basically saying is we have this idea that because of Aguna, the rabbis were lenient and they allowed witnesses, one witness or even herself, to testify that her husband has died. But that doesn't allow her any financial issue. It's just for Aguna. Comes Beit, Hillel, uh, Beit Shammai and they say, What do you mean? If we can accept... <coughs> Excuse me. If we can accept this testimony to allow erva, which is so serious, of course we can allow it to permit her to get money, which is less serious. I'm right, generally much easier. To which Beit Hillel says, I'm Rulan Beit Hillel. Matzinu she'en achim nechnesim l'nachala pia. What do you mean? We know that brothers can't inherit based on her testimony. If there's no laws of inheritance that kick in based on her saying that he died, doesn't allow anyone to inherit because that's a monetary issue so you can't say oh we allow it for erva but we don't but and and of course then we're going to allow it for money when it's clear that we don't allow it for money if let's say there's no marriage issue related there's no anything and somebody comes along and says so and so died we don't start dividing up his inheritance based on that testimony so again Beit Shammai says but still she gets her too but it's not the same from the text of the Ketubah, we're going to learn this. In the text of the Ketubah, it says that this money is for you in the event that when you go marry somebody else, you will get this money. The Ketubah is right in case he divorces or dies. And when she, and she can claim food, uh, like a stipend, a monthly stipend, till such time that she goes to get married. Once she goes to get married, she has to take the big lump sum of the ketuba, and that's it. She can't take it after that. So what do you see here? There's a dependency on her ability to get married and her ability to get her ketuba. So if we're going to allow her to get married, we're obviously going to give her a ketuba money. It's true that if she's just claiming money, maybe that would be an issue. But since she's claiming marriage and we accept it for marriage, that goes hand in hand with getting her ketuba money. And you can prove that from the text of the Ketubah. To which Beit Hillel said, Chazru Beit Hillel l'horoki divrei Beit Shammai. Beit Hillel was convinced and ended up teaching like Beit Shammai. We've seen a few cases where this happens. Gemara starts off. Chista is already going to limit. Rav Chista says, It's true, he goes back to this halacha, the Ein Ha'achim, Nechnesim L'Nachala Pia. The brothers don't get to go inherit based on her testimony that he died. But Rav Chista says, Nit Yabma, but if she becomes a Yevama, and she does yibum with the brother, just like we said before, since the ketubah goes hand in hand with the marriage, right, her remarrying to somebody else, likewise, yibum goes hand in hand with inheritance. So therefore, while it's true they don't inherit based on her testimony, but if based on her testimony she's obligated in yibum and she does yibum with the brother, he does get to inherit based on her one witness and or even her own testimony. And how do we know this? Because if the Mishnah and they, if Beit Hillel darshan based on the language of the Ketuba, we can darshan based on the language of the Torah here. It says he should be, take the place of his brother, meaning he gets the inheritance of his brother, and he did. In other words, he did Yibum, obviously he's going to get the inheritance as well. Amar Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman now brings a situation. Or a, a, not a situation, but a, sorry, a different possibilities of what she could say and what the halacha is going to be. Or we'll have some questions, actually. He's going to say one, and then we'll go off on that. Uh, actually, maybe two. Okay, let's go and see, and then we'll summarize. She comes to the court and she says, My husband died, please permit me to remarry. So in that case, She gets to get married, and she gets her ketubah money. If she says, But if she comes and says, I want my ketubah money, my husband died, and that's all she says, we don't permit her to get a ketubah money because she could be lying and it's just the money she's after. And 
If later she wants to go get married based on that, we don't allow it because we already have a suspicion that she was lying because all she was coming for was for the money. My time, huh? so what's the reason? Adata diktubate, because she came for the money. So those are the two halachas that Rav Nachman says. Now we get it, the two languages. If she says, I want to get married, yes. If she says, I want mektuba, no. So now they start with the question. They asked, what if she says, permit me to remarry and give me my mektuba. Do we say, since she mentioned the ktuba in connection, in addition to, I want to remarry, do we say she's really just after the money? Oh, Dilma. Or do we say, Or do we say, no, if people have a bunch of claims to make, they'll state them all to the court. And therefore, she was coming to really get remarried. But she also stated, and by the way, I want my ketubah money. So, they, and then they continue to ask, and they said, If we say, really, when she said, I want to get remarried, and I want my ketubah, we just assume she's believed, because she's just adding that. But, what if... But what if she starts off with, I want my ketuba and I want to get married? So, do we say, for sure, since she started with, I want my ketuba money, maybe that's what's motivating her, in which case we won't believe her? Oh, Dilma, or do we say, there should be a word here added, Mishum, uh, is it Mishum? Right. Mishum de lo yada bimai mishtarya. Or do we say, since she didn't. She didn't know which thing permits her. She might have thought, as it said in the Ketuba, right? Maybe she thinks she needs to demand her, I don't know if it's because of the writing there, but the wording, but maybe she thinks she, because the Ketuba always comes, she gets her Ketuba money before she gets remarried. Maybe she thinks that in order to get remarried, she needs to get her Ketuba money. And therefore she says, I want my ketubah money so that I can remarry, meaning she wants it and she wants to remarry, but she only said it first because that's what she thought needed to happen. To which the Gemara answers, take who we don't really know. Okay, so again, we get into all these discussions of how do we know when to believe and when not to believe someone, when do we have suspicions that they have some ulterior motive. Next mission, hakol ne'emanim lahaida. Everyone is believed, meaning a woman, a man, right? We accept any witness other than five people, which we'll see in the Gemara maybe is more than five. Chutz mi chamota, her mother-in-law, ubat chamota, the daughter of her mother-in-law, sarata v'yivimta, right? The daughter of her mother-in-law, by the way, would be the, the sister through his mother of her husband. Sarata, her second wife, right? The rival wife. Yivimta, the woman who she may in the future potentially fall to yibum to that woman's husband, meaning her husband's brother's wife, okay, so she could potentially become a tzara of hers, ubat ba'ala, and the daughter of her husband from another marriage. Why? Because all these people, we assume they dislike her for some reason and might want to bring upon her demise, and which would be what? If they claim her husband died, she gets remarried, what happens? If he really is alive, he'll show up, she'll have to get divorced both from the new husband and from the old husband, which means that she'll end up not being their relative anymore, and that's really what they want. I have to see why all these people dislike her so much. So, right, rival wife is pretty easy. Yivama is because she'll potentially be her rival wife, okay? The daughter of her husband, Chamota, and Bat Chamota, we're going to get to in the Gemara. So the Gemara says, Bat What if it's the daughter of her father-in-law, not the daughter of her mother-in-law? In other words, what's, right, the, the sister through the father rather than the sister through the mother? Do we say, Do we say, well, the daughter is like the mother. If the mother hates someone, then the daughter's going to hate someone. And therefore, since the mother's not in the picture here, because there is no mother-in-law, because her, it's her father who she shares with this, right? They're, they're connected through the father and not through the mother of the husband. So she doesn't have, the, this isn't her mother-in-law, right? Her, she's not the daughter of the mother-in-law. And she has a mother-in-law, but it's just not this woman. The, um, right, this man, we're basically connecting her to the father-in-law. So, do we say, ha ha leka ima de So there is, right here, there is no mother that hates her, so maybe she's not to be, right, maybe she is to be believed. Oh, Dilma, or do we say, tama de bat chamota de amra ka achla legirsana de ima. Ha chinami ka amra achlana legirsana de be nashai. 
do we say that this daughter of the father-in-law or of the mother-in-law will be the same issue? What will happen? She basically doesn't like this woman because this woman is married to her brother. And when the father dies, what will happen, right? Or when the mother, right, the mother's money will end up going to, right, both the father's and the mother's money will end up going to this son. And this son is married to her. So what do we worry? That she's basically going to inherit her mother's or her father's items. So we are concerned about that, right? That they're going to dislike her because she's going to end up with money that was kind of in her, their family. In which case, it shouldn't matter if she's the daughter of the father-in-law or the daughter of the mother-in-law. Okay, so that's the question. Um, but the girsana is what the mother, the girsana de ima means the mother worked. That money is going to go to um, to her, right? Let me just try to remember how this works. Her mother worked. It goes to shivya la avi mi beit avia, right? Because her mother ended up marrying. Just think about why am I having issues with this. Her mother, one second. Her mother, Gersana de Ima. Her mother is married to the father, right? The Bat Chamia, one minute. If that's the case, Bat Chamota. It's the mother-in-law who's married to, right. Her money will go, she's married to the mother-in-law, right? The mother-in-law is married to this guy's father. So the, the daughter her mother's money, since she's now married to the husband's father, will end up going to his son. Likewise, if it's just if she's related to the father-in-law, the father-in-law's money will go to the son. And then this woman will end up getting her, her money, basically, or money that was from her family, either through her father or through her mother. Either which way, it's forbidden. So now they say, so that's really the question. Tashma, let's learn it from here. Okay, there's another bride that says there's only five women. If we add bat chamia, then it would be six. To which they say no. Right, which should be really the bait the girsana de ima and the bein neshaya, which means lo shna bat chamota, lo shna bat chamia. In other words, the point is, if it all comes from the same place, you only need to call it once. Just say the mother-in-law's daughter. It could be the father-in-law's daughter. It's all one and the same, and it's included in those five. So that doesn't prove anything. Okay, so basically we had a question. We don't really have a way to get to the answer. Next question. But isn't there a Mishnah that says there's seven women? So why are we saying here five women? Okay, it actually should be a Brita. It's not a Mishnah. It's a Brita. Um... Hayi Rabbi Yossi, that bright is Rabbi Yossi, it should be here also, Ditanya, as it says in the Brayta. Rabbi Yehuda Mosif, Av Eshet Av Vehakala. Okay, the mother's, the, sorry, the father's wife, meaning your stepmother, and also your daughter-in-law, Akala. Amrulo, they said to him, Eshet Av, Rei Bechla Batabal, Kala, Rei Bechla Chamota. What are you talking about? Eshet Av is your stepmother. What did we talk about before? Your stepdaughter. That's Batabal is your stepdaughter. So, right, your husband's daughter, that's your stepdaughter. It's the same relationship. It's just like the stepmom is not trusted for the stepdaughter. The stepdaughter is not trusted for the mother. And likewise, the Kala, the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law are the opposite relationship, right? It's the same, two sides of the same relationship. So that's why, now they, they don't disagree. It's just, Rabbi, well, they sort of disagree, we're going to see. But they're saying, he adds that. He has seven. Why do we have five? Because we said five, the rabbis said five, which includes seven, includes those other two, maybe even the Batchamiya, which is another one, but we're ignoring that for right now. So now, Rabbi Yehuda, why does he think to list these separately? We're now going to show, you can't say it goes both ways according to Rabbi Yehuda, because the reason is all what we talked about before. And that's, we gave two options. Either she hates her because she just hates her, which we'll talk about why. Or we have this issue of money. That there's a concern she's taking my money that really is my family's. So if you say, Chamota, the mother-in-law, she hates the daughter-in-law. Why? 
because she's going to eventually inherit her stuff, right? The mother's stuff really goes to the father. When the father dies, it goes to the son. And this is the son's wife. But Kala, but the daughter-in-law, why would she hate the mother-in-law? The mother-in-law is not taking any money that's supposed to be hers. Bishlama Batabal, the, the stepdaughter, Disanya Laeshataav, the Ambre Kaachilagirsani de Ain. She hates her her stepmother. Why? Because her stepmother, assuming let's say the mother died, the mother's inheritance went to the father. Till the father dies and then it goes down, right? But right now the father has it. The father is now feeding this woman from her mother's step. She doesn't like that. But why would the stepmother hate the stepdaughter? There's no financial thing that she's getting of the stepmothers. So Elam, so now they say, okay. So basically Rabbi Huda says, the reason for those is not the flip of the other, right? Just because it goes in one direction, it doesn't go in both directions. In which case, Rabbi Huda seemed to make a good case that the Kala shouldn't hate the mother-in-law and the um the stepmother shouldn't hate the stepdaughter, so why should they be listed according to Rabbi Yehuda then? Which is what the Gemara asks now. Elamai Mosif Tarte. So why did he add those two if they don't hate them? To which they answered, Ela Kala my time asanya la chamota di megalet libina called avda. The Kala hates the chamota. Why? The mother in law. Why? Because she reveals to her son everything that she does. In other words, right, the daughter in law. The sorry, the daughter-in-law hates the mother-in-law. We know, right? Situations. I'm sure most of us are familiar with some situation where this happened. Whereas this always a little bit of, um, not always. There's sometimes difficulty between in-laws and daughters-in-law, and you know, in all directions. Because what happens? The mother-in-law tells the son all sorts of things, bad things about the daughter, right? Sometimes there's mothers-in-law who don't think the daughter-in-law is good enough for her son, and then she'll say all these bad things about her to the son. So, of course, the daughter-in-law will dislike the mother-in-law in that case, right? You see, the things that exist today still exist then. Again, not to say this always happens, but it definitely happens. avda. Same thing with the stepmother, right? How many times does somebody have a stepmother where the daughter doesn't like the stepmother and complains to the father all the time about his wife? So she doesn't like the daughter-in-law. I'm sorry, she doesn't like the stepdaughter. So there you have it. That's why. Comes the rabbis. So it sounds like a good argument. So what do the rabbis have to say to this? Well, the rabbis say, Just like the water's reflective, right? Reflects one flip face. It reflects your face to you. That's the heart of a person to a person meaning. If you treat someone disrespectfully, you hate them and you do mean things to them, they will likely hate you back. So if the relationship goes in one direction, then it obviously goes in the other direction. So if we go back to saying it's the financial thing, if one hates the other for the financial reasons because she's taking her stuff, well then the other will go back and say, I hate you as well. Right? We often see this reciprocal relationship. It's very hard to love someone who's really mean, right? who, who has a dislike for you. Even if they don't actually do anything, you, you feel it. Right? You feel that animosity and it creates tension between you. For Rabbi Yehuda, he understands that first. It's not reflective because he thinks they hate for those reasons and they hate for those reasons. But what's the issue? This pasuk that talks about the reflection is about Torah. What does it mean about Torah? So Rashi gives two explanations. If you look at Rashi, Bidivrei Torah Ketiv, it's the third wide line. Lefi panim v'lev sh'atan oten Torah. it's according to the heart and the face that you put into the Torah, meaning the effort that you put in, that's how much you will get out of it. This is a good tafyomi um, or learning source. Libcha omed l'cha l'ami girsa, im yabat gagata ba timsa. If you work hard at it, you'll be rewarded by it. Vim lo yagata lo timsa. That's one way of reading it. The reflection is in terms of however much effort you put into it, that's what you'll get out of it. Comes second verse of Rashi, Lishnachrina, Im rabo mazbiyo panim hu machkim, ve'im lav eno machkim me rabo. If your rabbi likes you and treats you well, you'll be wiser. If not, it'll be hard to learn. And we all know this in terms of relationships, it's a big responsibility of a teacher. The more a teacher loves their students, the more the students will learn. The teacher has tension with the students and doesn't like some of the students, that will come across and the students understand that right away. They're very perceptive and it becomes very difficult to learn, to teach them properly. Okay, a lot of good pearls in this, uh, in this text here. 
Okay, moving on. Amarav Achabar Avia, Baal Bamarava, they asked in Israel, Hamotah Baal Acharmi Ken Mahu. What about a potential future mother in law? What does that mean? Do we believe her to testify that this woman's husband has died? What is a potential mother in law? I mean, everyone theoretically, I can marry anybody. Well, what we mean is if I'm married to someone and he has a brother, since I am potentially, I could fall to Yibam to the brother, and let's say I don't have kids. Do we believe that woman to say, my husband died and I now have to do Yibam or Chalitza? Now, why? Why would she do that? If, you know, does she hate me? Because, here we're going to read the Gemara. Do we think that she looks toward the future and thinks, well, potentially this woman could end up being married to my son, and I'm, I'm going to hate her because of that. So I'm going to prevent already that situation from happening. How so? I'm going to go, it seems like a crazy thing, but I'm going to go testify that her husband died. She's going to have to do Yibam with my son. Then the husband's going to show up. At that point, she's going to be forbidden to ever marry my son. She's going to have to get divorced from him and we'll never be able to marry him. So are we concerned that if she says the son died and she now has to do Yibam, do we not believe her? Because maybe she's just trying to mess up this person's life. So the answer is on Amabed, Tashma, let's learn it from here. Although we're going to see, they're going to try to compare it to a case where someone's not really the mother-in-law now, but could be in the future. But in the end, they're going to say the cases really aren't comparable. If I come along and say my husband died and my father-in-law died. So that basically means I can go remarry and theoretically my mother-in-law can remarry. But what do we learn? I'm not trusted when it comes to my mother-in-law. However, once I say my husband's dead, and if my husband's already, right, all these cases where my husband was abroad, then I don't really have so much connection with my mother-in-law at this point. So she's not really functioning as my mother-in-law. And not only that, once I say he's dead, she's really not my mother-in-law. So, says here, Tina Seviti talk to Bata. So I'm trusted about myself. I can get my tuba and get divorced. Vechamota asura. But my mother-in-law can't get remarried. We can't trust me. My time, chamota asura. Love Mishum Da'amrina, and is it not because we have to say theoretically, I'm still, she's still my mother in law, right? If we say she's my mother in law, that means that theoretically we're worried that maybe my husband really isn't dead. So I'm Rina and Loba Alamait, Velo Maybe both of them didn't die, even though we allow me to marry, there's this concern that maybe they really didn't die. The Hadika Amri Hache, so then why did I say this? I was really just trying to mess up my mother in law. Even though right now she's not bothering me because she's not my mother in law. But I'm worried she's going to go back to being my mother-in-law, right? When my husband shows up and my and my father-in-law shows up, she's going to go back to having that relationship, and I want to ruin that relationship. So what do I say? When he gets back and she goes back to being my mother-in-law, she won't be able to let's say anymore because she's going to have to get divorced, and basically she'll be, you know, humiliated in front of the family, and they won't take her seriously anymore, and she won't be able to abuse me. Very interesting theory. To which the Gemara says, Dilmashane Hatam, Diragish That's different because in that case, she already was her mother in law at a certain time, for a certain period of time. So she already has this bad feelings toward her, and that's why we don't believe her. But when it's a potential future daughter in law already there, we're not really concerned about that. That's, that's too distant. Okay, new Mishnah. We're going to have three cases in this Mishnah, and then the Gemara is going to go into each case. Edomel met Vinisait. So one witness said he died, and she gets remarried based on that. Ubachava Amar Lomet. One witness then comes and says after she remarried, he didn't die. Harezo Lotetse. We don't believe that witness, and she doesn't have to get divorced. Because we already allowed her based on one witness. One witness becomes like two, and then we don't believe the other one. Okay, we'll see this more in the Gemara. Edomel met Ushnaim Ovim Lomet. One said he died, and then two came and said he didn't die. Even if she already remarried, Tate said, because now we have two against one. Shnaim Obrimei, two said he died. Ve'ed Omer Lomet, and one witness said he didn't die. Apapishaloni said, Tina say. Even if she didn't marry yet, she could still get married, even though one witness now comes and says he's not dead. We already had two who said yes, so for sure she can remarry, even if she hasn't yet remarried. So you see, there's all these gradations of what type of contradictory testimony and at what stage if she's already married do we make her get divorced if she's not married can she get married right there's different possibilities so going back to the first case one witness said she he died and she got married and then another witness said he didn't die she doesn't have to get divorced but it sounds like tama didn't he say it 
since she already remarried. Haloni said, Lotina said, but if she didn't get married, she doesn't have to get married. Um, sh- sorry, right. If she didn't get married, it sounds like we wouldn't allow her to get married because now we have one witness who said yes, one witness who says no. That's contradictory testimony. But that's a problem because how Hamar Ula, Ula already stated, Anytime the Torah permitted one witness to count like two, right? Then that's Torah believe one witness. It counts like two. So this is really like a case where there were two witnesses who said he's dead and one who said he's not. So we shouldn't believe the one witness. So what do we say? One wouldn't stand up to two. So this is what they say. If the Beitim ruled she's permitted to marry even though she didn't yet marry, then if another one comes and says no, we ignore that. But if the Beitim hasn't ruled yet, then this is typical contradictory testimony. One says yes, one says no, we throw it out of court, we can't let her do anything. But if the court ruled already, then it's like two, and then we don't allow anything after that. Second case. Eidomel mate, ushnaim oblim lo mate. Okay, now in this case, we have two issues. Number one, we now have two saying she died. He, d- I'm sorry, two saying he didn't die. And this woman, before anything, she was becheskat esherish. We knew she was married. So that we have going against her. So therefore, even if she remarried, she has to get divorced. So comes the Gemara and says, Pshita de ain't varav shalachab in kom shnaim. Of course, one Testimony wouldn't stand in the place of two. So, of course, why is the Mashiach even telling us this? You might remember we had this before. We'll see this again. It's talking about disqualified witnesses, meaning, for example, like women. Women in general, their testimony is not accepted. So now what are we going to say? Let's explain it, and then we'll see what this means. We're going to have two different explanations of Rabbi Nechemia. This is the first. That's what Rabbi Nechemi says. In a minute, we're going to get to the first explanation. Anytime the Torah believes one witness, we go by the majority. What does this mean? If you have two witnesses that are not kosher witnesses, for example, it could be relatives, it could be women, they testify, like in the second group of witnesses, it says he's not dead. They are like, okay, now listen again, against one man if one witness had come in the beginning and he was a kosher witness he was a good kosher witness there was no problem with him at all he wasn't related he wasn't one of the list of the people who can't testify and he was a man so if you have two non-kosher witnesses against one man generally the two non-kosher witnesses don't count but in a case where we count Echad, one witness we allow this we allow psule edu like we do in this case those two against one kosher witness is like Shnei Anashim They're really counted like two men. So those two women count like two men, which means if one said, yes, you can get married, and then two said, no, he's not dead, right? One said, You're, he's dead, and two said, no, he's not dead. And if those two were women and the first one was a man, they override. That's the Chiddush You might not have thought that. You might have thought one man is better than two women or at least maybe equal because he's a kosher witness and they're not. Comes Rabbi Nechemia says that's not the case. And that's what this Mishnah is teaching us. Again, Rabbi Nechemia didn't say that that's what the Mishnah is teaching us, but the Gemara understands maybe that's what the Mishnah is saying. Maybe, maybe we understand Rabbi Nechemia a little differently, and then it's telling us something different. No. Rabbi Nechemia didn't say what we thought, according to the second explanation. When you have one kosher witness, you could put up a hundred women it won't knock them down. A hundred relatives won't knock them down. No way, no how. But, if first there was one witness and it was a woman, and then came two witnesses, then we go a harov deo. Two versus one. Okay? V'tirtze led Rabbi Nechemia hachi. Rabbi Nechemia omel, this is how we read Rabbi Nechemia. Kol makom shemina Torah erechad alacha harov deo. Okay, that's just what he said. We follow majority. V'asu, you know, as we go by the numbers, v'asu shte nashim. Two women versus one woman is like two men versus one man. But two women versus... Okay, well, I'll read it inside now. But if you have one witness who said he died and it was a man, and a kosher witness, and two who said he, he's not, he didn't die, then it's like... And the two are women, then it's like one against one. Those two women are not strong enough to override. 
and then we just leave it. So then that's just contradictory testimony. That's not what we're saying here. Here we're saying they override. There they can't override. Okay, last case in the Mishnah, and then we'll read the, the following Mishnah, and with that we'll finish for today. Shnayim Oblim Mate, and then Eid Echad Omer Lo Mate, and then one witness came and said, no, she can even get married right then. Um, since two said it, even if she's not married, she can marry. Now this again is very obvious. So, my Kamashvala, Bipsula Edu to Kidirabi Nechemi, do you want to say maybe they're talking about two who were women and the other one was a man, or the other was a woman and we're trying to show Rabbi Nechemia, well, if that's the case, Hainu, right? Ucha Rabbi Nechemia, da Azabata Rov Deot, Hainu Ha. But then it's exactly the same as the second section. It's teaching you the same thing. You wouldn't need it. So, Mao de Tema Kiazlina Bata Rov Deot, the Chum Rav, Alakula Lo, Kamashmana. No, because if you learned it in the second case, that's to be strict and not allow her to marry. But maybe you won't follow majority of women, two women versus one woman, or maybe two women versus one man, in the case to permit her to marry. Well, Kamash Malan comes to teach you that, in fact, we do hold that way. And then both second parts of the Mishnah are teaching you Rabbi Nechemia according to either the first or the second reading. New Mishnah. One said he died. Okay, this is two wives of the same man. This is going to be an interesting case. One said he died and one said he didn't die. I know he didn't die. And one says I know he died. So here we're going to split the law for both women. It's a crazy case. The one who says he's dead, he's dead gets to go get married and get her to her money based on everything we learned. But what's the problem? She's the tsara of the other. She's the rival wife. Rival wives are not believed. So the rival wife can't get married based on this testimony. And the rival wife herself said he didn't die. So she doesn't have her own testimony to rely on. So So one, we presume this husband is half dead, half alive, right? It's a crazy thing. What if they disagree about how he died? One said he died in bed, and one said he was murdered. You can't get married based on this because it's contradictory testimony. Both of them admit that he's dead, so what's the difference how he died? And therefore, they can each get married based on their own testimony. Again, this is a question of do we have any evidence to think that they're lying, right? Do we say they contradict each other, that looks like they're lying? Or do we say, no, maybe not, right? We look at each one individually. One witness came and said, he died. And another witness said, no, he didn't die. Then a woman comes and says, he died. And then and then she says, no. And here they say, even if it's the rival wives, at this point, she can't get married. This case we'll understand better when we get to the Gemara. With that, we'll finish our shir for today. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom.